a chapter of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. <clears throat> it is a friendship group in support of morality without superstition, church and state separation, freedom from religions, and rational thought. I have two quick quotes. Those who can make you believe in absurdities can make you commit atrocities, Voltaire. And the fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober one, <laughs> George Bernard Shaw. Our speaker today, Howard Moores, has apparently evolved into a very humble person. Bill Van Druten showed me a list of all of his uh, accomplishments, but he himself says, just to tell you, that he is a professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at UMD, and also a distinguished neighbor of Bill Van Druten. <laughs> Thank you for speaking to us today. Okay, um, on February 28th at 3, actually, it turns out the lecture is at 3.15 on Friday, February 28th. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick little bit of history. 2009 was the 200th birthday of Charles Darwin. And so in 2009, I was, the, I was head of the geology department, and a friend of mine was head of the biology department, and we started a series called the Darwin Day Lecture Series. And, over the last, and this will be our 12th Darwin speaker. And so every year, every other, well, biology started it, and then we picked the second speaker, geology, and then biology, and we've alternated. This is the 12th of the Darwin lectures, 12 years. And um, um, it's been a really interesting program. We've had some really great speakers. To, uh, from, uh, all across the realm of biology and, and geology and natural history, paleontology. And this year's speaker is Andrew Noel. Andy Noel is a professor at Harvard. He is considered to be one of the leading figures in the evolution of life and the early history of Earth. Um, we actually have uh, some people at UMD. Um, the one I tried to get to come and speak to you, who is a much better speaker than I am, Letitia Brangman. Letitia Brangman studies uh, early Earth, atmosphere, and oceans, and, uh, and she was excited to come to UMD because we have one of the, we have exposures of rock in northern Minnesota that record much of Earth's ancient history. This early Earth, particularly the transition from an, a, 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 from, well, from, uh, particularly the transition from an atmosphere with no oxygen to an atmosphere with oxygen, which happened about halfway through Earth's history. We'll touch on that a little bit here. I hope you're not, um, um, but I hope, I hope you like this. But Letitia uh, studies iron formations, and we happen to have some of that in Minnesota. In fact, we have uh, an endless supply of potential source rocks for her to study. So I tried to get Letitia to come talk to you, then I tried to get my colleague Phil Larson, then I tried to get um, Cody Sheik, He's a, a geomicrobiologist from the biology department, and you end up with me. That tells you what they said. <laughs> um, I put this picture up because the picture of Darwin that you had on the announcement with the big white beard, that's the one we always see. He wasn't always, he wasn't born with that beard. He looked, <laughs> he looked um, different as a younger man. I think this picture is about 1835, might actually be about four years, might even be 1830, I don't know for sure. I just found it on the web. And, um, but at, that, at the age of about um, 22, Darwin set sail on the Beagle uh, to be the companion of Captain Fitzroy. And that was, that was the way things were done back then. And boy, I could, how much time do you have? Um, a colleague of mine and I uh, teach a course in natural history, and uh, we spent a bit of time on Darwin. So. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've studied Darwin quite a bit, but um, the captain on sailing ships at that time did not, um, did not, what's the word, interact with the crew. 
the captain was separate. There, were, there was a second, there was a second in command, and there were lieutenants. They dealt with the crew. The captain never, ever ate with the crew, talked to the crew. All orders were passed through intermediaries to the crew. So the captain would bring along uh, someone to eat, to have dinner with, and talk with, and Darwin was that guy. Um, and throughout that voyage, he really developed as a scientist and be, and and became really a geologist. He, we think of him as a biologist because of his, uh, he was, he was a true natural historian. And uh, anyway, so I, I thought I'd put up a, a younger picture of Darwin here. So our speaker who's coming on February 28th is Andrew Knoll. He, <coughs> excuse me, he um, uh, has authored hundreds of scientific papers he is, like I said, the world's expert, one of the few world's expert on early Earth, and uh, his book is really a good read. This is this is uh, some of the best writing, best natural history writing that I've read in a long time. Um, so, what I'm going to be talking to you today is a little bit about the early Earth and Andrew Knoll's study area. I don't want to give away any any of his punchline. But I also want to acknowledge that a lot of the information that I'm giving you, because I'm not an expert on early Earth. Um, I have studied it extensively, but, I, but that's not my research area. And so a good friend of mine, uh, George Shaw, uh, was a professor in the Twin Cities, in, of geology in the Twin Cities, um, spent 20, his last 20 years in academia at Union College in New York. He's recently retired and one of his retired, one of his, uh, activities in retirement was to write this book on Earth's early atmosphere, oceans, and the origin of life. And so there's a, uh, so I want to acknowledge those two before I, I thought I'd read to you a little bit of uh, Andy Knowles' uh, preface to this particular, you can all hear me okay, right? Um, 14 years ago, amid millennial predictions of global computer failure and the apocalypse that never transpired, I decided it was time to explain myself. For more than two decades, i had been preoccupied with attempts to understand an unfamiliar planet. Uh, one, without, one without plants, one without animals, uh, and with little or no oxygen in the atmosphere. And that planet, of course, is the Earth. Um, that, uh, that, that planet was the young Earth. Um, that planet was the young Earth, and Howard Loeb transited from that early alien state to the world we know today stuck with me and still does as the greatest story Earth science has to tell. In part, the quest is paleontological, requiring meticulous examination of ancient rocks in search of fossilized microbes. In part, it's phylogenetic, using the information recorded in genes to sketch out the tree of life, a universal genealogy uh, that makes predictions uh, for life's geological record. And in part, the task is geochemical. Um, could we, develop a could we develop a narrative of history that, stre that, um, that stretches from the origin of life to the spread of animals through the oceans? Can we construct a parallel account, and I want to emphasize this, can we construct a parallel account of the rise of oxygen and recurring ice ages? Um, and most importantly, could we combine our narrative of life and environment to understand how organisms and, and their surroundings have co-evolved through time? And that is what Andy Knowles' um, presentation is going to be about the coevolution of of organisms and their environment over the la over Earth in Earth's early history, um, and actually how that pertains to the evolution of Venus and Mars, also, which we'll touch on in a second. So what I'm going to run through here, and hopefully I can get through this in reasonably short time. Um, Super Bowl isn't until 5.30, sort of right? Yeah, and I did not get to watch it. Um, I gotta go to the Twin Cities right after this, and the house I'll be staying at doesn't, only has digital broadcast TV, no cable. Is, is the Super Bowl on digital? Or just on broadcast? I have no idea. Um, I, wanna, I wanna touch on the nature of the accretion of the Earth, how the Earth was assembled, where the stuff came from. What, where'd the water come from, right? All this water that you're drinking right now, where'd that come from? Um, well, briefly, we'll touch briefly on the tectonic and thermal state of Earth's early surface, uh, the implications of that for the primordial atmosphere, uh, the carbon cycle through time and implications for, you know, for, 
form of carbon isotope. They're not going to do much isotope work, trust me. Um, the faint young sun problem. Um, why was Earth warm? Why was early Earth warm? That, we're going to touch on that one. Uh, how conditions related, to, well, can, how these conditions can shed light on the emergence of life and uh, how life may have begun, the timing of the emergence of photosynthesis, um, which, which is very important, of course, to putting oxygen in our atmosphere. Um, life could never have evolved on Earth with, in, with an oxygen-rich atmosphere, but life could not exist today without it. So Earth has gone through a huge transition. And then a comparison of the histories of the atmospheres of the terrestrial planets, particularly Mars and uh, a little bit of Venus. We're going to cover, so basically what my friend George Shaw would call great moments in the history of life. Starting with the origin of the Earth, um, the, the formation of the moon, which is still controversial. Um, we know it's there. It had to form, okay? But how it got there is still a little bit controversial. Um, some of the earliest oceans, er, early life, development of photosynthesis, Ox oxygenic photosynthesis. So you see that one, about the middle there, just to the to the right of the of the beginning of the green arrow, about two things over to the right of the beginning of the green arrow. Oxygenic photosynthesis is reasonably certain. Once once photosynthesis developed, why did it take 400 million to a billion years? to oxygenate the atmosphere. That, that's, a, that's, real, that's a real problem in early Earth's history. Why it took so long once photosynthesis was developed. And then, of course, um, yeah, some other thing. I want to give you a sense. Uh, I work with this on a daily basis, and so I have no idea how others perceive the expanse of time. Um, Earth's about 4.65 billion years old. That's just a number. 4,650 million. Okay, if you want to do it that way. Um, it, and we've been around, <laughs> let's see, where are we here? I got to, I'll yell. I won't carry the microphone. Um, Earth starts here, uh, a geologic period we call the Archean. Um, that's 4.4 4. 4 billion, 4 billion, 3 billion, 2 billion, 1 billion. Um, we're, we're not even on this one. We're way up at the top a little tiny fine line of about, about four million years of Earth history, okay? So there's a tremendous amount of Earth history before we even come along, in fact, almost all of Earth history. Uh, you guys may have seen a, like a 24-hour clock at some point in your studies, you know, the Earth being born at 12 a.m. and we show up at 11.59 and 52 seconds or something like that, p.m., right? Um, we haven't been around very long. But there's this enormous expanse of time, most of, most of which life is really simple. And it isn't until um, the, it isn't until the Paleozoic, about 540 million years ago, that abundant life bursts onto the, onto the scene. Okay. <clears throat> okay, accretion. What do we know about the Earth and its formation? We know that Earth accreted from a, step from a stellar nebula, a solar nebula. Um, we, we can see this happening today. We see this Hubble telescope images. Just go look at an archive of them. And there's hundreds, thousands, millions of observations of proto-solar systems, solar systems in all stages of formation. We have a pretty good idea of how the Earth formed. Um, and so Earth basically condensed out of a solar nebula. Most of the material ended up in the sun. A little bit of it, the garbage, some dirt left around in, in the formation became the planets that we know. Um, how long did that accretion take? Not very long. It turns out that from a solar nebula that was so diffuse, you could fly through it in a spaceship at high speed and not even hit a particle, to forming the sun and the planets, um, probably took less than 100 million years of Earth history. 100 million is nothing, right, compared to 4,600 4, million years of history. So the accretion happened fast, all right? And what was the early Earth like? Um, we don't know because most of us weren't around. How old are you, Bill? 
Um, but um, the Earth may have been molten, probably not for a terribly long period of time. When you think about how fast all that stuff came together, you could do a little physics calculation on how much energy is released with all these particles coming in to accrete the Earth, um, and it would have to be pretty hot. Uh, probably the whole thing was molten. Um, there's evidence that oceans were possibly here by 4.4 billion years. By the way, the GA stands, it's Latin, it's giga anum, billion years. Uh, so if you see the, the GA up there, it stands for billions of years. Um, there was an early atmosphere. There had to be an early atmosphere. What it looked like, we're not quite sure. Um, many of you probably have heard of the of the Miller-Urey experiment. Stanley Miller was a biologist, chemist, in, in the early 50s. Well, I'll, I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. Um, there was a, at that time, in the early 50s, people felt, people thought that the Earth's early atmosphere was probably highly reducing. Now you're, unless you're a chemist, you're going, what the hell does that mean? Um, no oxygen, certainly, and not ox and no oxidized gases like carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an oxidized co compound, right? CO2, okay, it's oxidized. Um, it, was, it was believed that Earth's early atmosphere was methane and ammonia rich. The nitrogen wasn't nitrogen gas, it was ammonia. And, and all the carbon that's on the Earth, our Earth's carbon inventory was not CO2, but was methane. And so methane, ammonia rich atmosphere. Um, however, about that time in the early 50s, thought was really changing, that the early Earth's atmosphere was instead highly oxidized. It's very CO2 rich and nitrogen rich, not ammonia and methane. The two are very different, and they give you a very different Earth. Um, where did the water and the carbon, where the volatiles, the, the, stu the stuff that we breathe, the stuff that we're made of? The question? Yeah. Um, Take a big bite. Okay, a hundred million years of accretion when it Earth wasn't Earth; it was just dirt. Does that do geologists consider that part of the four and a half billion year yes. timeline of Earth? Okay. Yes. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. The question was, yeah. Did y'all hear the, the question? Was is that hundred million part of the four point six five? Yes. The way we date the solar system, we don't have any rocks that are that old. Uh, that are well. We don't have any rocks that are that old that actually have not been altered in the 4.65 billion years. What we date are meteorites, the stuff left over from the formation of the Earth, asteroids, uh, meteorites that fall to Earth. And if we date them, what we find is they have many different ages, but none of them are older than 4.65 billion years. That's the maximum age of any meteorite we've ever dated, which means that they form at the same time as the Earth, right? The, the, the solar nebula condensed forming those things, setting their atomic clocks at that, at that age. We have no rocks on Earth that we can date to 4.65 billion. About 4.2 we do. We can date back to about 4.2. Um, but rocks have just have been altered uh, too much. <clears throat> so what was the early Earth <coughs> like? What we look at, we go back to meteorites again. And Antarctica, if you want to hunt meteorites, Antarctica is the place to go. They fall on the Antarctic ice sheet, they get transported by the ice out to the moraines, and they get deposited in the moraines. So you go to these moraines and you, and you find meteorites. And um, um, almost all of them are stony meteorites. About 14% are iron meteorites. How many of you thought you found a meteorite at some point in your life? I get, we, every day somebody calls in, I think I found a meteorite. We call them meteor wrongs. Up at the park. <laughs> but occasionally, uh, somebody comes in with, yeah, it looks like it might be. Or if you, if you park your car on the street, and the morning you come out, and there's a hole in your windshield and a rock sitting on your front seat, well, if you don't have any kids next door, um, that's how you find meteorites. You see them fall. Okay? That's how you really find them. Um, 85% of meteorites are stony, 14% are iron, and uh, about one, a little over 1% of them are these things called carbonaceous chondrites. 
And these carbonaceous chondrites contain an abundance of hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen. And that's where Earth's volatile inventory came from. All these meteorites coming in at the beginning of the Earth, those gases being released into the atmosphere as they either come through the atmosphere and burn up, or they strike and dissipate all that energy, all those volatiles are released. Um, and if you, do the, if, you do the, if you do the inventory here and look at the meteorite collections about what we think meteorite distribution is, it's almost exactly equal to the volatile inventory of Earth. So it's a reasonable hypothesis that this is where all the water and stuff came from. Then the moon formed. Ruined everything. Because at about 4.5 or so billion years, about 100 million or 200 million years after the accretion, a body about the size of Mars hit the Earth. And it's the only, it's the only model that seems to make sense from all the, all the, all the um, orbital dynamics of the moon. And, um, so something big hit the Earth, broke the Earth, it would have stripped off Earth's atmosphere completely. It would have wiped out Earth's atmosphere in an event like that. And then the two coalesced back into the moon and the Earth. Um, and then, after that, there were still meteorites coming in. And so, um, an addition of about 1% of the Earth's mass after the moon forming impact could account for all the water, all the air, all the things that we breathe. Okay, that's um, and us, we're part of this too, we're the carbon, right? So, um, all right, we're going to explore two hypotheses. Early Earth was carbon dioxide and nitrogen rich. Um, so, uh, don't, don't, don't make notes, okay? Um, Earth's, volatile, Earth's volatile inventory uh, can largely be explained by degassing of a small proportion of the total amount of meteorites, right? Um, what that means is the CO2 hypothesis requires that all of Earth's volatile inventory come primarily from volcanoes. Slow degassing, CO2, water coming up from below that was stored, that all these meteorites brought in. Um, because they were degassed from magmas, they were hot. And therefore, they have to be oxidized. So all the carbon that would, be, that would come through a magma would have to be CO2. You wouldn't get reduced, you wouldn't get methane, you wouldn't get carbon compounds like you. You wouldn't get flesh coming up in a magma because it's going to burn it up and oxidize it. Right? So you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't get organic molecules. You'd just get CO2. Um, and so I'm not going to read the rest of this. There's no oxygen, or very low levels of oxygen. Everything is CO2 and nitrogen rich, and it accumulates over a long period of time. The problems, um, if you have a really CO2, if you have a really CO2 rich atmosphere, it's, if I have a rusty bolt, and I want to get the rust off my bolt, you open the refrigerator, what do you pour on it? Coke. Who said Coke? Soda. Yeah. Coca-Cola. So it's some kind of carbonated beverage. It's very acidic. Okay. Why is it acidic? It's loaded with CO2, right? Um, and so acidic water, so the early Earth would have been very acidic in, in this CO2-rich atmosphere case. Um, that would have led to enormous weathering rates, really high weathering rates. There's no evidence for that in the geological record. Another problem, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. You guys all know that. But CO2 is not as potent of a greenhouse gas as other greenhouse gases are. What's the most potent? It's a question. It's methane. Okay. The early sun was only about 70% as luminous as the current sun. Our sun keeps getting brighter. And if you had another hour, I could explain how that all works. Our sun is getting brighter. As it burns its hydrogen fuel, the core of the sun is collapsing. It, and if you're familiar with weather and climate, it's called adiabatic heating. 
So as the core of our sun burns hydrogen and converts it to helium, helium takes up less space. And so the core of the sun is continually shrinking over time. As it shrinks, it has to heat up. That's just basic physics. It has to get hot. So the Earth is about 30% more luminous now than it was in the early Earth. So the question is, why was early Earth warm at all? With a 30% less luminous sun, Earth should have been a frozen, a frozen ball. But it wasn't. <coughs> so, so, and, and so to keep it warm, there would have had to have been a huge inventory of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which should also have led to the weathering that, that we don't see. <coughs> Um, let's see. Um, another problem with the CO2, if, if, if oxygenic photosynthesis had originated by 2.7 billion years, or perhaps even somewhat earlier, quite a bit earlier, um, why, was the oxy why, was the, why did it take a billion years to produce the oxygen in the atmosphere we see? If CO2 was unlimited and everywhere, once, once photosynthesis developed, why didn't we get oxygen in our atmosphere? It's a big, it's a big question. Um, and then the last one is, why did life evolve so quickly? Where's the carbon inventory? If it's all CO2, where's, where's the carbon inventory for the evolution of life? There is an alternative, and it's called the methane nitrogen atmosphere, or methane ammonia atmosphere. And this is the Miller experiment. You probably heard about this in elementary, or middle school, maybe, maybe high school. Um, Stanley Miller built an apparatus, you see it there, a completely closed, sterile environment. And they put water, salt water in there, and they put in um, methane and ammonia and hydrogen gas. That's all, they, that's all they put in there. And they circulated it by heating the water, the steam would go up into a reaction vessel and they would spark it like lightning to get, add an energy source. And then there was a condenser and then they would sample this stuff. And after a few days of running, completely closed, um, sterile environment, what did they get? They got a very long list of amino acids. Um, uh, well, some of these you've heard of: glycine, uh, sarcosine, alanine. You, these are these. Are, if you've done anything, if you've been ill, you've probably heard someone talk about these amino acids in your system. All these are amino acids, and uh, except well, urea and methyl urea, I'm not sure that's an amino acid, but um, anyway, all this stuff formed within a short period of time from nothing but an abiotic environment and methane and ammonia. It turns out we can study other planets and other nebulae by using spectroscopy, looking at the light. Organic compounds, particularly amino acids, are abundant throughout the universe. They're everywhere. There's, there's no shortage of them. They're found in, in stellar nebula. They're found on the moons of Jupiter. Uh, they're just a natural consequence of the formation of planets. Water is everywhere, right? Um, organic molecules are everywhere. Um, OK. The problem with a methane-rich atmosphere. I really should wander. Is this turn on? No, this is a microphone. I'm going to mess you up now. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to walk around. Um, methane, you guys know methane, natural gas. It's probably, well, I won't talk about where methane comes from in this room, okay? Um, carbon with four hydrogen atoms on it. It photo dissociates very quickly. You put methane in the atmosphere and ultraviolet light hits it and cleaves off the hydrogen atoms. And you get, and then, it, and then it's reactive, so it reacts and you form carbon compounds, okay? So methane does not have a long residence time in the atmosphere. So a methane-rich atmosphere would have to be regenerated, okay? Um, or, organisms can do this. Uh, organic methanogenesis, uh, these, these organisms are very ancient. They were around early in Earth's history. But there's also inorganic methanogenesis. If we have carbon in the surface environment and you get like hot fluids and things like you'd find on the seafloor moving through it, you produce a lot of methane. A lot of methane is produced at mid-ocean ridges by hydrothermal circulation. Not too hot, a few hundred degrees as opposed to a few thousand degrees to get to melt rocks. Um, but 
it's, it's common. So methane can be commonly produced, particularly if you have a methane-rich atmosphere that was constantly raining organic compounds into the oceans, right? And the ocean was reprocessing those into new methane, you can maintain a methane atmosphere for a long time. Um, and here's the cartoon that shows how you do this. But early Earth's surface was warm, uh, very active tectonically, not plates like we know today, but very active seafloor circulation, seafloor spreading, things like that. Um, and so there is a mechanism for keeping the methane-rich atmosphere. So if you have a methane-rich atmosphere constantly raining organic compounds into the ocean, you would not have the limestone rocks that we have all over the world today. So it turns out if you take Earth's, car Earth's surface carbon inventory and convert it to organic molecules, not limestone bedrock, the oceans would have been about 10% organic molecules by weight. That's half of the concentration of cytoplasm. Your cytoplasm is about 20% organic molecules. You'd have an entire ocean, <coughs> speaking of the primordial soup, right? You'd have a, an entire global ocean that's 10% organic molecules. And that sets the stage for, and these are organic molecules, these are, these are amino acids. <laughs> Keep hitting that. These are amino acids, these are fatty acids, these are organic molecules produced inorganically that are all the components of stuff that's in you now. And all it would take is some kind of a surface environment with energy sources to produce this enormous amount of organic material. Now the question is, how did that material become life? Well, read Genesis. And um, so here's the phylogenetic tree. And Andy Noel talks about this in here. He'll talk about it, I'm sure, on Friday the 28th. Uh, George, my friend George, this picture is actually from George's talk. It's the same thing. There's a common ancestor down here somewhere and is the common ancestor of all life on Earth. And we kind of know what it looked like um, because we know what all the rest looked like. By the way, we're up, we're on that branch right there. That's us, okay? We're on the animal branch. This is the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes, so or the eukarya, okay? And, um, but they all stem back to some common ancestor. And um, what, so the question is, how did complex life come about? Well, let's try and do it in as simple a way as possible. Because you don't want to do it in the most complex way. You don't want to say, okay, let's make DNA. That might be a tough sell to all of a sudden whip together some DNA. What is the one common thing that all life does? Reproduces. It reproduces, it replicates. What's the easiest way to do that? Divide. Sorry? Divide. Well, div divide or, but, but even the division, cell division requires replication. So the two things are exactly the same after they divide, right? You gotta replicate. And so, uh, although DNA might be a, a tough one, RNA might not be. In fact, in particular, transfer RNA. Your cells right now are reproducing the code, and it's transfer RNA that's doing it. The molecule's really clever, and it's only 80 nucleotides long. It's a, it, so each of those other chemicals I showed you on that graph from the Miller experiment are nucleotides. Well, 80 of them stuck together in a certain sequence gives you transfer RNA, and transfer RNA replicates. It reads, transfer RNA can read the code of other organic molecules and reproduce them. That's what it does. And so the simplest way to develop life would be to, you, by random chance, in a global sea of 10% organic molecules, a random chance of assembling a molecule that could replicate itself. It probably happened time and time again. Question is, how do you turn that into an organism? Right? That's it's still it's another step that we have to go through. Um, and here's that here's that table again. I just threw it in here a second time to show you that, that, that these things are out there. 
All you have to do is string in this, if you do the math, take um, a global ocean of 10% organic molecules and have all these things be randomly different, there is a bunch of different types of organic molecules in an early ocean like that. And at some, at some point, something had to come together that could replicate itself and then persist, okay? Um, let's see. Is, it, is transfer RNA, I'm trying, I, I used to do science a lot. Transfer RNA is the specific molecule that brings the molecules together, right? Yep. It's like it, it takes one molecule at a time. There's three different types of RNA, right? But only transfer RNA is common amongst the three domains, or? I, you know, I'm not, and again, I'm, I'm not the expert on this stuff. This is the end of the molecule that does the reading. Right. And, and it, each transfer RNA hooks up to a distinct yep. DNA it, um, it takes nucleotide. that polypeptide sequence and it assembles it onto the other okay. molecules. And it can okay. assemble proteins. Yeah. Um, so there's another interesting thing that could have happened in the early oceans. Um, amphiphiles. These are molecules, fatty acids, fatty molecules. You're full of them. Um, world's full, the world's full of them. Fatty acids that have one end that's hydrophobic, doesn't like water, and one end that's hydrophilic, does like water. And these fatty acids, um, they form, we, we know they do this. They actually, if you have enough of them in a, a solution, they will naturally just come together and the hydrophobic part will end up in the middle. The part that doesn't like water will end up in the middle. They form these little bundles called micelles. They form bundles with uh, uh, fatty acids around the outside and the, and the hydrophobic parts pointing in or they form sheets and layers. Um, these, they're common. You can form them relatively easy. You can do an experiment in your kitchen and make these things. Um, if they were forming in a primordial ocean, they'd be perfect little bags to hide certain, rep certain molecules that could replicate. The question is, you know, how this all came about. Um, and let's talk about the rise of photosynthesis quickly here. So these two rock pictures are from of Mary Ellen Jasper. Some of you, I'm sure some of you in this room has gotten Mary Ellen Jasper samples or jewelry. Comes from the Mary Ellen mine up by Virginia. And these are stromatolites. Uh, those little round things in there are algal stromatolites. Algae was growing on these little pinnacles and uh, in a shallow two billion year old ocean that now is the, is the, the Wabak Iron Formation, right? And, uh, and so the, this, this is by, by two billion years ago, these are abundant all over the world. And so um, it looks like photosynthetic organisms were present by about 3.2 to 3.5 billion years ago, producing oxygen. And so the question is, well here, now this is the geochemistry. Turns out certain elements in, in surface environments behave very differently in the presence of oxygen, abundant oxygen. Sulfur is one of those. So if we look at sulfur isotopes, sulfur isotopes in the early Earth history, four billion years down to about 2.2, are all over the place. They wouldn't, be, they wouldn't look like that if there was oxygen in the atmosphere. Then all of a sudden, sulfur isotope ratios come into lockstep with one another. And that, it, that happens in the presence of oxygen. So there's pretty good evidence that there was abundant oxygen in the atmosphere by about 2.2 billion years ago. But photosynthetic organisms developed a billion years earlier. Why did it take so long to make that oxygen-rich atmosphere? Let's see, I'm, what's coming up next here? But I'm gonna, this is a quiz. Uh, okay. I want to move. Um, I don't. Well, this does this portable one work? Is there a? There, we got one. Okay. Um, I move now. There goes. Now I got the camera.
micromanage the control. Um, oh, you're okay. Okay. Photosynthetic organisms developed 3.2 billion years ago. It takes a billion years for them to produce a lot of oxygen. Why did it take them so long? I'll try to walk toward it away from the camera. Help me out. Why did it take so long? They're lazy. That's like my kids. Okay. Um, they're lazy. I'm not, I'm not going to make oxygen today. What limits bacterial growth? By the way, these are like cyanobacteria. It's a blue green algae. Did it cool down today? What's that? Did, did things cool down? Could be cold. Could, the environment could just be cold. No evidence for that. Not for the whole time. What limits bacterial growth? Nutrients. What? Nutrients. Nutrients. Nutrient limitation. What would the limitations be? Phosphorus, nitrogen, or carbon. Phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon. If there's supposed to be all this CO2 in the atmosphere, and weathering rates are high, nutrients shouldn't be very limited. <laughs> but you're right. If those nutrients were limiting, that would really make a huge difference. But in the, in, the, in the atmosphere model with lots of CO2, weathering rates would be high, and that shouldn't be a problem. Hmm. So if it's nutrient limitation, it would suggest there wasn't a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, that it was, in fact, methane rich. That could, and also, I've already given you the punchline. What's the other limiting factor besides nutrients? If there was abundant CO2 in the atmosphere, models would suggest that once photosynthetic organisms evolved, oxygenic photosynthesis, producing oxygen, once they evolved, it should have only taken about 20,000 years to produce the oxygen-rich atmosphere. It took a billion. It, so it could be nutrient limitation. But the other thing that photosynthetic organisms have to have is CO2. And if CO2 was not abundant in the atmosphere, like some of these models suggest, CO2 could be the most limiting factor. Not, um, not phosphorus or other nutrients. So it took a billion years to do that. So there, that, that's, I got through this. I was asking you. That's the I'm asking you stage, okay? I just want to ask, does that mean there was more methane than people? The methane argument is, more, is stronger? Argument is a good word. Okay. There have been um, special sessions at national meetings that have ended in arguments about this, yes. Was it CO2 or methane? With people that know far more about this than me. With people like Andy Noel and George Shaw and all of their other people. So the question, well, and Andy Noel's going to address Mars on the 28th too. Um, what does that mean for Mars and Venus? Mars in particular. We, what do you guys know about the early history of Mars? Had water, not an atmosphere. It had, it had water. It had what? An atmosphere. An atmosphere. It had liquid water. We, there are river valleys all over Mars. Mars had an ocean. Almost certainly we see beaches. The rovers, you know, we know, Mars had an ocean. If the sun was, Mars is frozen right now, right? Mars is a frozen planet. Uh, it probably thaws out, a, a warm summer day at the equator of Mars is probably about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. There's not much air, it's really thin, 1% of Earth's atmospheric pressure, but um, Mars is a frozen world. If Mars had a liquid ocean in its early history, when the sun was 30% less luminous, how do you explain that? Magma core is like Mars. It didn't have molten core at that time? It, it, it had a similar history to Earth, similar accretion history to Earth, yes, to get to her point. Magmas were present, magmas were present, but Mars is small. Mars cooled off really quickly. Uh, it, it has to have a lot of methane or carbon dioxide to produce a greenhouse effect to, exp to accommodate the faint young sun problem all the way out to Mars. And CO2 really isn't enough to do that. 
it's not as powerful of a gas as methane. What I was getting at was, it wasn't there a, did the molten core produce a, 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 a magnetic field that he kept sort of the solar wind from stripping off the Yes, atmosphere? absolutely. Early Mars had a magnetic field which protected it, fr protected its atmosphere from the solar wind trying to blow it away. So early Mars had a, had a, was very similar to Earth, almost certainly had a methane-rich atmosphere which produced the greenhouse effect to compensate for the faint young sun problem. Turns out Venus was probably very similar. Now Venus is a, is a hell house today. Surface temperature on Venus is 490 Celsius, surface temperature, all over the planet. That's 900 Fahrenheit on the surface. Hotter than your kitchen oven on the clean cycle. <laughs> That's the surface of Venus. There's no life there now, there's no water there now. But there likely was in the early Earth. Anyway, that's all I got for you. The age of a planet? Yeah. Well, it's the meteorites. The only, re only real way to date the age of the Earth is the meteorite collections. I mean, how do you date the meteorite culture? Oh, uh, radiometric dating. So, um, a real brief primer on that. Certain radioactive isotopes, or radioactive isotopes, decay spontaneously into daughter products, right? Like uranium. Uranium is radioactive. And you rate the different isotopes of uranium decay through a particular series to other elements. And they do so with, with extremely uniform and predictable rates. And so in the early Earth, when the early Earth formed, there would have been, um, if, you know, you, well, there would have been, like, say, only uranium. There would not have been the daughter products of uranium that are produced by the, by the radio, radioactive decay. So you, when, you, when you get one of these rocks, you measure the ratio of, say, uranium-238 to lead 206, which is, the, which, is the, which is only produced by the decay of uranium. You measure that ratio, and it's, it's a chronometer. Because that rate, that rate is independent of temperature, that rate is independent, whoop, we just had a that crash here. Um, and so radiometric dating is, can be, is extremely accurate and reproducible. So I appreciate your comment on something. In the 1960s, uh, I was a student at Berkeley, and took a molecular biology course. And they had one of those devices you showed there where the sparks and the uh, sealed atmosphere, and they, they were probably using uh, ammonia or some other atmosphere. But they uh, told us that eventually they formed little globules, maybe like the little mice, micelles. Probably. But with changes in pH, they would divide. And that was, that, that was I don't know whether that's been heard of that before, or that was something else, but anyway, what they were suggesting was once a certain amount of organic material accretes, uh, sl slight changes in this environment might cause it to behave in a way that looks like reproduction. Oh, yeah, that might well be. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we're here. <laughs> I think we well, every, pretty much everybody in this room has a pretty good idea of how we didn't get here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, how, how, how reproducible life comes about, this early ocean idea it, um, is, is enticing, right? It, it's, it's because it's, um, because it makes the whole world ocean a petri dish with, what? 10 to the, 10 to some high order experiments going on at any one time in every different kind of pH and every different kind of temperature, and every different salinity, right? So you get this global ocean that has all of its normal differences and circulation, and you have this 10% organic molecules that are constantly being recycled. And so the, the number of sort of experiments that's going on is, yeah, is what? 10 to the 50, 10 to the 50 experiments per day or per year, you do the, do the math. Only one of those has to, has to end up with a reproducible molecule. 
Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but it, it, it worked, right? I, I would argue that there are thousands and thousands of species that occupy that niche. I mean, I, every higher animal, every dog, every cat, us, apes, zebras, I mean, the, but they can't communicate. The level of communication is different, right? So we stumbled upon something, I mean, although I would argue that maybe ape, maybe whales can communicate, you know, they, but then whales don't have these, right? And, you know, whales say, God, I got this great idea for, for this invention, but I don't have thumbs. <laughs> and we don't know, we don't know that. So, so I would argue there's lots of higher organisms, but um, this story is just the beginning of the story, right? There's a lot, there's a, um, evolution happens. Just ask anybody that's died from the coronavirus, okay? Uh, these viruses just pop up, they evolve. In fact, virus, st the study of virus evolution is really important, right? And um, uh, so we, and anyway, they can evolve rapidly. But um, there have been many instances in the past where catastrophic events have just about destroyed all life on Earth. The end Permian extinction, 95% of everything on Earth went extinct, right? And out of that came this enormous radiation, this speciation, right? So there are certain events, you guys all know that when the Pangaea, right? All the continents came together during the Paleozoic and formed one massive continent called Pangaea. Well, that stifled speciation, stifled evolution, um, because that's, because bringing everything together is not what prompts speciation. It's isolation that prompts speciation. So once those continents started to break up and Gondwana and Laurasia separated, right, and then North America and Europe and Asia and all these things separated, evolution went nuts. And we got dinosaurs, right? Totally different than what was here before. And then we have the end Cretaceous extinction, right? We have the, the KT impact, where the dinosaurs are all gone, right? And so, and what happened out of that came a whole new radiation, rapid speciation of mammals, all kinds of mammals, going every direction, including those that led to us. And so the, the story, is, is, that's only half the story. The other half of the story is another very complicated series of events and evolutionary <coughs> directions, a lot of dead ends, um, and of course, natural selection is a slow process. Um, both environment and genetic mutation play a role in that, right? Um, so anyway, yeah. That is, that is a philosophical discipline that I am unfamiliar with. So you're gonna have to talk to philosophers on that one. I, but and we need to get over that. Uh, <laughs> this idea that um, We can express ourselves so we, so we, we, we think we have, you know, um, these special traits that, you know, animals don't feel sadness. Bullshit, I've got, got dogs, right? I'm, I'm a dog owner. And my dog, I can tell when my dog is happy, when they're sad, when they're embarrassed, when they're lonely. And you can tell every emotion these dogs have. It's just chemical reactions in your brain. And they have the same brain we do, right? It's not that different. So, and so, and we have to quit this idea that we're somehow special, but you guys know where that whole special thing comes from. <laughs> and, um, and it's hard to, for people to get over that. I, I was just telling a story, and then I'm, then I'm gonna shut up. I had a student come into my class, or into my office, this past week, Wednesday, I don't know. And uh, she wants to take my introductory geology class because she wants to be an environmental science major. And, um, so I said, what's the problem? Well, last semester she was struggling with some, with some health issues, mental health issues. I'm not going to throw her name out here. I can't even remember it. So we wouldn't. And, um, but she's really got herself under control. She, you know, working with her doctor and she really wants to get back seriously into school. And I said, what are you currently enrolled for? A, a, a composition class, Muslim, um, Muslim history and something and history of Christianity. And I said, you want to be an environmental science major, why are you register for those? She said, because that's what my parents wanted me to register for while I'm still getting over this health thing. I said, uh-huh. She said, well, I come from a very conservative religious family. My parents are very Catholic. And, um, and I said, how old are you? I said, 21. And I said, shouldn't you be able to pick your own classes? Well, 
Um, anyway, so we talked, we talked for about an hour about um, a bunch of stuff. In particular, what came up was Bible study. And I said, I love Bible study. I said, studying where those texts came from, how they evolved, what was their origins, what is the history of religion, where does religion come from? I said, that to me is Bible study, not what I think you're talking about, which is memorizing passages so you can draw them and sound smart at some, you know, in some conversation. And so I had her read the, the um, first couple of paragraphs of the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation myth, which I assume, I assume some of you have read. She goes, well, that's Genesis. I said, yeah. Yeah, 3,000 years earlier, right? Mm -hmm. I said, said, that to me is, that's studying religion. That's studying, studying this history. So she left my office all smiles and excited about my course. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.